when they asked me to do this, I, I procrastinated a little bit. I didn't start building a presentation until a week ago. Uh, and then before I even started, I asked Jamie and Aaron Andrews and Sarah Carlson, what did the attendance list or the registration list look like? Uh, and even a week ago, it was pretty clear that we had all levels of knowledge here. So we have the people that are very good at doing small plot trials. We have people that are experienced with on-farm trials. We have some people that are at least from my my knowledge of the names, anyhow, may not have any experience with uh, on-farm trials and, and trials in general. So what we decided to do um, was basically try to get everyone on the same page of some of the minimum things that we need or some of the things we need to be thinking about. So the, I can't remember what colors, I think the yellow sheet that's coming around is actually, um, so that way you can doodle on it if you're, if you're so experienced that I'm talking way below you, um, but you'll be able to take notes on, on what I have going here from that sheet. Um, so what I did is I basically came up with 10 considerations that we should be thinking about as we design on-farm trials. Um, and so I'm gonna walk through those and then we're, we'll do a couple scenarios or discuss a couple scenarios and then um, we'll see what the clock says after that, but we, we have another, another activity potentially. So the first thing that I point out is we need to make sure that treatments make sense. So we want to, we always talk about comparing apples to apples and not apples to oranges or apples to bananas or whatever else. So we really do need to make sure treatments are, are comparable. Meaning we want to be able to say, well, we learned something from this or we can learn something from it. So the, the example that I provide here is talking about um, treatment A with like a fall seeded winter rye plus oats uh, and a treatment B that might be uh, like a spring seeded turnips and rapeseed. Well, we're not really gonna learn anything with those two treatments, unless we're thinking of it more from a system standpoint, but we're not gonna learn anything about um, the, those mixes that, that we can compare to each other. Um, whereas the second one, you know, a fall seeded winter rye versus a fall seeded winter oats, now we're looking at something that will be winter hardy versus something that's going to winter kill. So we may learn something about what those comparisons look like. Okay. And the next part of this is, goes back to that KISS mentality. So keep the treatment simple. Okay. So use a control plus one or two um, comparisons that, that go with that. Um, I find myself falling into maybe getting on the more complex side of things. But we can look at it from the standpoint of, you know, a fall seeded mix um, with rye, turnips, and vetch, a, a, just a plain fall seeded rye. That'd be a good comparison. We could do that. It's fairly simple. Uh, we could add in fall seeded turnips. Not a problem. We might add in a fall seeded vetch. Now we're starting to get, well, these are simple comparisons. It'll violate a rule later on <laughs> that I'll talk about. Um, but then we can even start thinking about, well, what about a, a late burn down versus an early burn down uh, with some of those treatments? So all of a sudden this becomes a very complex or more involved set of treatments. And um, yeah, we can do it, but it's gonna take a lot more time. Uh, there's a lot more considerations that need to come into play with it. Uh, replicate, replicate, replicate. Replication is imperative. Um, if we don't have replication, we have no statistical power. We lose, I mean, we're, we're out automatically from that standpoint. Um, statisticians say you need a minimum of three. Um, I aim for a lot of times four. Talking to Sarah Carlson, we were, she was thinking she liked six. Um, but we all know that stuff happens, it may happen at planting, it may happen when the custom herbicide guy kills half the plot, it may happen at harvest, you're going to lose replications or plots. So start out with more than you need for your statistical powers at the end of the year. Um, a plant ecologist, he was, I, I'm taking a plant ecology class and he's saying he wants a minimum of 10. So. Mark Carlton shaking his head, 10 doesn't work, right? Especially in Southern Iowa when you can't get uniformity, right? 
So we have to think about the environment that we're working in, the fields that we're working in, but we definitely need to have replication. Um, we want a minimum of three, and then that typically means you need to start out with more than that. Randomized complete block design, RCBD. This is the level of statistics that I'm comfortable with. It's, it's the basic statistics, meaning you need to have replication, and within each of those replications, you randomize the treatments. Okay? Um, again, this is all for statistical power and being able to use that data well. So the example I show here, I realized after I sat in the back here for a while, you might not be able to see it in the back of the room, but what is wrong with that set of, type of a setup? I got four replications. They're not randomized. Leave it to an engineer to figure it out. Or, or they could be randomized. Well, they could be randomized, but more than likely they're not. See, I, I put on my corn and soybean hat. I split the planter. So he goes that way and he turns around and comes back. So it made it really easy for the farmer, but it's not a randomized complete block design. What you have here truly, you, you have the replications, but you have fixed versus variable treatments. And that's a difference in statistics. You can still do statistics with it, but it's not as strong as if you were to randomize those. So we might look at something like that. Okay? So we can, we can very easily now do things like this, right? GPS guidance systems are slick. Set the planner up, zigzag through the field or however you need to go. You can randomize it and it doesn't take any more time might actually be quicker because you might not have to change out planter boxes. Field variation. We ha it, this gets caught up in experimental error all the time. Uh, but if experimental error is too high, guess what? You can have 10 bushel yield differences in corn or beans, and it may not be statistically different because you may have too much variability to, to catch that. So we need to try to take it into account wherever we can. So gravel roads, prevailing winds push that dust. Well, at least in the area I grew up, it was a limestone, right? So we had higher pHs along those gravel roads. Topography, soil fertility, past field history. So that past field history may be, where's that beef feedlot setting? And where did they haul that manure 15 years ago? Right? So I, this may be hard again for some of you in the back to see. This is a 160 acre parcel. It's been split 50-50. And the lines on there are the soil map units. Which one would you rather put a trial in? The right half or the left half? Probably over here in the left half, right? If you look at those soils, they kind of go across. And so you're going to capture that variability uniformly across there. Whereas if you go with your rows this way, each treatment's going to look different. So you're not going to capture that variability as well. So the other thing is, I know this parcel very well. So I know that right there is a hog barn. Right there is a finishing house and a sow gestation barn. And so I know where that manure has actually been applied. Most winters it came out that driveway right there and went at an angle across the field. So the soil fertility maps are horrible as far as high soil test P and K right there. So this parcel, quite honestly, I don't necessarily like because I know that there's wet holes over here that are gonna kill it and I know I have field variability from that manure history on the other parcel. Okay, so consider farmeries. So you remember I showed you that list of treatments there? Farmeries says you get much more than three, maybe four treatments and they start scratching their head going, boy, this is going to take me a lot of time to plant. It's going to take me a lot of time to harvest. And what all do I have to do in between? So we have to think about what we're asking that farmer to do or what maybe even they're asking themselves to do it, but we maybe need to help pare that down a little bit, um, thinking about what their time commitments are going to be. Um, and maybe the type of equipment that's available. Do they have it or do we have to go get it from a neighbor or do we have to go find an equipment dealer that has what we need or do we need to find a custom guy 
So we need to think about that from a, and I lump all that down into that farmer ease category. Um, where I try to remind myself setting up trials that we're really not trying to do earth shattering scientific research. We're trying to evaluate systems or evaluate treatments um, to help us guide management on those farms that we're working with. There's a difference between yield monitors and weigh wagons. I know just about enough of this to be dangerous. Um, yield monitors, yeah, you can take the yield over a much longer area. You have less downtime because you're recording it as the, they go. Um, you can map it if you want. Um, and it automatically incorporates in test weight and grain moisture. Well, the downsides of a, of a yield monitor tend to be the benefits of a weigh wagon. So we can take shorter strips. So if we have a lot of variability out in the field, we can cut off a strip at 400 feet and do a much better job with a weigh wagon. We get much more accurate weights because we're not working off of a calibration. Okay, um, and we don't require a calibration, right? With a, well, you need to make sure the scale's working right, um, but typically that's, that's gonna be a easier thing to do. Um, yield monitors, some are good, some are bad, and some are indifferent. So do they have a single point calibration where you take a weight and you just draw a line through that? Or do they have a multi-point calibration that takes into account a full load cell versus a, a, a lighter load cell, right? So there can be differences there. Um, if you're looking at something like hybrids, you may have differences there because of test weight. And so if that calibration doesn't take into account some of those things, uh, you may not be getting a fair yield comparison off those. And then weigh wagons, if your sample collection requires you to, to take samples, a yield monitor is a little bit more dif difficult to take those grain samples from. You can still do it, it's just a little bit more difficult. Whereas a weigh wagon, uh, you can grab those before that weigh wagon gets emptied out. More data than just yield. So we kind of fall into this mentality of, yeah, we want yield, and that's pretty well a given anymore. But what happens if the yields are non-significant? Or what happens if the yields are drastically different? We don't necessarily know why, other than our treatments, right? So we, we tend to say, um, think of the, the, the trials and how they're being set up and what makes sense for some of that additional measurements? Is it stand counts? Is it lodging? Is it disease severity? Is it uh, emergence or something like that? Then you have to take into account again whether it's a short-term type of measurement that you're gonna be able to see. So stand counts, biomass, insect density, weed density, things like that. You may see those right away. But then there's other measurements that you may need to wait a while on. So bulk density, organic matter, soil fertility, some of those things, you may not see a difference in a year. You may not see a difference in five years in some of those. So we have to think about what that measurement is and, and are we gonna keep that trial around long enough for those measurements to really make sense. We don't wanna bulk the data. So um, that's really why we did a randomized complete block design, right? So we had the data there so we could use it for statistical use. So, um, so we want the data from each of those individual strips for that statistics. Some cases, if we're doing stand counts at multiple places in there, we may want each of those measurements separate as well. So don't kind of pool this data together and do an average. Um, and turn that in. You may use that as far as presenting it back to the farmer or presenting it at workshops, but from a statistical standpoint, we're much better off if we keep each of them individual. And then, most importantly, have fun with it. If you're not having fun with it, the person you're working with on it is likely not gonna get a good impression of it, and you may not have the enthusiasm to follow through on it. So if you're not gonna have fun with it, it may not be worth doing to begin with. 
Um, and so we really want people to have fun with it and we want people to be able to learn from these trials. And I think that's sometimes forgotten. So there's the, the 10 and you have these 10 on the yellow sheet. What I want to do next is I want to pull in an exercise thinking about how do we set these up. And so I think what we'll do is if within your tables, if you can get together and discuss a scenario, and I'm going to say this side, think of scenario one. And if this side can think of scenario two, go through and discuss those, read through the scenarios. Scenario one was a 80 acre field that was overseeded with winter rye, uh, good fall growth. Um, it's basically March, we're, so going backwards a month. Um, wondering, or the question is wondering about spring burndowns and what herbicides or herbicide or herbicides uh, could be used. Um, not totally convinced that glyphosate's the answer, I guess. Um, wants to plant April 11th, and then there's the 16 row planter, 8 row combine, 90 foot sprayer with three 30 foot boom sections. So, anyone want to volunteer to come up and enlighten us with what their discussion had? Paul Castle's volunteering. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, you have to come up to me. <laughs> this one was a little bit more complex than I had envisioned it when I first wrote it. Uh, I, I thought it was a good, good exercise, but uh, r right or wrong, I, uh, Mark Hannon and I just talked about using two kind of uh, uh, residual plus burn down type herbicides. We're thinking like the full rate of atrazine, like two quarts of atrazine uh, plus crop oil, maybe plus a nitrogen source like AMS or something, plus harness. So we have kind of a burn down and residual. And then and I, I don't know if this will work, but like Verdict is a new herbicide from BSF and it's got Sharpen, which is a burn down product, and it has Outlook. And we we're going to soup that up with their uh, methylated seed oil and a uh, nitrogen source. And that's going to be our two treatments. And uh, so basically, we, you know, we, we, we figured the 90-foot sprayer is a typo, that it, since he has a 16-row planter, it's probably an 80-foot sprayer. So, <laughs> but even if it isn't, we're going to just plug three nozzles on each side or whatever it'd be and make an 80-foot sprayer out of it. And we're just going to, we're going to randomize and replicate. And we're just going to go across the field skipping 80-foot passes. You know, first do the atrazine and harness one and then come back and do the verdict one. So, and then we're going to take uh, probably a, kind of a percent uh, kill on the, you know, rate the percent of kill we get on the rye, uh, maybe maybe one week after application, maybe six weeks. Uh, we're gonna check the height of, height of the corn, we're gonna check plant population probably around June 1st. We're gonna check for insects. Um, so that's what we're gonna, and then obviously yield. Okay. And we probably figured we'd probably spray the whole thing with glyphosate, like an early post, like a June 1st type of application, depending, you know. And then uh, Mark and Mark and Mark were talking too, and we said, "Well, Mark said we'll just keep it simple. We may just do one week ahead of planning and two weeks ahead um, with just plain glyphosate." And we also talked about Mark said maybe just two rates, maybe a 32 and a 64. So that could be similar but different type of treatment. So, sure. anyway. okay. Anyone else have anything that they would add to that? Or alter from that? Yeah. I don't really know if the, you know, the sharpen or the verdict would be that good of a burn down. Uh, I really don't know. It might be really weather dependent. I mean, there might be a couple guys in here that might, might know more than I do on that. So, so yeah. Yeah, so the, the comment was will sharpen or verdict really do that or not? And, and that's it's a new product, and maybe a little less is known. On, on effectiveness with it. At least it can be recorded. She not, might not be able to see us, but. Yeah, Jim, Jim Fawcett brought up another point that you could, uh, it, we're, we're assuming this grower maybe has had some poor experiences with glyphosate. And if we look at the rye today, it has not yet joined it. So everything out there is strictly leaf material. 
the growing point's still below the ground. So you could almost do a timing of application mm -hmm. trial in this and say you could go out there and maybe apply one to two rates of glyphosate as it exists today and then delay and come back in 10 days when the, the, the rye has jointed and maybe make the same applications, which would be a split plot, replicated, randomized block, but it, but it still could be done. And then you have to hire a statistician to work with you. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Virgil. <laughs> I, okay, I, I, th I think both of these, though, uh, show some of the difficulty of the keeping it simple, stupid uh, concept there, because this is one that's really easy to have all kinds of products and all kinds of timings in there, and it becomes really complicated. And that was one of the things I think this group here really struggled with, is how far do we really go with it? That was the, the gets at the comment that I made of some, well, I think I made it up here somewhere, but... Um, you, you have these initial discussions in maybe January, December, maybe even February, and so you have a lot of ideas, and then when it comes to actually sitting down and saying, okay, we know we're doing a trial together, but what are we doing? And so it may actually be refining that and asking what, what is the real question? You know, it may not be what the initial thought was. And, and so we, you have to kind of work through it in stages, and you're right, Virgil. We've got to keep it simple, and so we, maybe we do need to sit back and say, okay, what is the, the true question or the true issue, and how do we actually get at that? So, okay. Can I ask you what you would do with the difference between the planting planter and the sprayer? What would I do? Uh, quite honestly, I sometimes go into those blind um, I've been known to sit down with the grower and just realizing we may set the blocks up or the treatments up with the sprayer, but know that we're going to have a border area there that we have to just skip in that harvesting because it's going to maybe have half treated, half untreated. You know, and that may not be a full combine pass, but if the farmer's comfortable with that, yeah, we can do it. If not, then we have to start widening things out and then that gets into that variability issue again um you know and so some of it's what is that comfort level and yeah i gave 10 rules or 10 considerations and you're always almost always going to start violating those uh depending on how <laughs> strict you are on yourself but uh, you, you kind of have to balance what what's best to do and what makes the most sense to do what was the atrazine for was that to kill the rye or I didn't think it had much effect on it, does it? So, okay. Okay, for the sake of the recording, the question was is rye effective, or is atrazine effective on rye? And the comments were if you put a high enough rate on, yes, it can be. <laughs> um, but then you get into some environmental issues, right? Especially if you're in parts of uh, northern, northeastern Iowa. So, okay, so we'll need a volunteer for scenario two, but here we're uh, a seed dealer that's starting to use cover crops. Um, two 80 acre fields, one's going to be first year corn, one's going to be fourth year corn. Um, question about do different hybrids, corn hybrids perform differently um, with that cover crop? Okay, anyone want to tackle that one or? Well, with this scenario, uh, we don't know what cover crops are in the field, so we kind of chose, um, she has a 24 row planter with a six row combine, so we could come with two different hybrids. Um, within or four different hybrids in the field. It depends how complicated you want to get it. And then you could have uh, once 12 rows uh, with or without insecticide within that, within those hybrids. And uh, you're gonna, can't com compare uh, corn rootworm on the four year 
uh, corn field compared to the first year corn field. And uh, with the not knowing what uh, cover crops we have, we could kill some of the cover crop earlier or later in the spring to see what the yield effect would have been underneath those. And we wanted to have hybrids with the same sister line uh, varieties. Then uh, with collection of data, we want plant populations uh, both in the spring and the fall. We want to have uh, corn rootworm counts, beetle counts. Uh, we need to know a cover, cover crop plant counts on how uh, well that the cover crops uh, were killed in the spring. Uh, yield and test weight. So maybe the group wants to expand on that. Thank you. Any additions, comments, thoughts? So they took it a diff even maybe a different way than I was initially thinking. I was thinking, you know, more from the higher residue, more of a, is that first year corn responding more like a continuous corn field because of the cover crops? But it's all a matter of interpretation, right? So what was your expectations? Yeah, but it's not the six days. What kind of a cover crop do we have to begin with? I was assuming rye, but I didn't put that in there. So, yeah. And last year, you had letting the cover crop go over, changing yeah. the yellow of the cover crop, blaming and that effect on the corn. Because, like, when I thought about this, I've, I was thinking, well, we kill rye at a normal time and then plant the different hybrids. But making the rye go longer, maximizing rye growth, which is where sometimes we get into the trouble with dinging corn. So, I hadn't thought about that. That's a really good point to add to it. So, so Sarah's comment was recognizing that there could be the, if we hold that cover crop longer, so maybe it's a, the, the killing timing that you'd mentioned, and then what effect does that have on yield with different hybrids? Yeah. Okay. So with that, I have used up five minutes more time than they gave me at the beginning and 10, 15 more minutes than they have on the agenda for me. So with that, I, I hope that we were able to give you an idea on what, it, what to think about as you start setting up on-farm trials, whether it's with cover crops or with anything else. Um, and hopefully these scenarios start getting you thinking about that because I think later on um, there is going to be a discussion about, okay, what trials are needed? What do we need more information on? And what do we need um, to, to see happening out in the fields? So thank you. <laughs>